I'm still not sure why exactly I'm doing this. If it's some sort of self-important need to just say what I went through, or potentially help other people who may be going through the same or similar thing, or I, I don't know, just let you guys know what happened. But I usually don't share a lot of personal stuff. But I'm making an exception here. So this all goes back to March 30th of this year. I was sitting down to dinner with my fiance, and uh, the dinner was steak and roasted baby carrots. Something that is worth mentioning before I describe what specifically happened here is that uh, a few times before this, over the course of several months, I would have instances where I would be eating something and it would get stuck partway down my esophagus. Well, not stuck necessarily, it would just stop moving for a bit until one of two things happened. Either I regurgitated it back up, or it eventually continued down the esophagus into my stomach. But those instances happened far enough apart that I didn't pay too much mind to it, even though I definitely should have. So we go back to dinner, I start having the carrots, no issues. And then I have a piece of the steak, and I feel it get caught part way down. A couple of the things I tried doing uh, with instances before that helped the food pass were um, I would just try drinking something to help wash it down, or I would like jump a little bit to like try and cause it to jostle loose and go down the esophagus. But um, jumping didn't work here. Uh, I tried drinking something, in this case milk and it didn't help. So I tried drinking water. That didn't help either. I tried drinking a bit of soda. That didn't help either. So now I'm in the bathroom uh, feeling just pressure building as this piece of steak is still caught in my esophagus. I try going back through the things that I usually did to help uh, loosen it or at least induce like a regurgitation of it. And I can feel pressure building up around this thing and then eventually I feel this sharp searing pain. I can't feel the food at all anymore. All I can feel is pain. It is the most painful thing that I have ever felt in my life. And it's a pain that's so deep inside my chest that I can't do anything about it. So this onslaught of pain happens. I scream a bit and I'm just constantly moaning. I'm like on my knees in the bathroom, my fiance immediately comes to the bathroom asking what's wrong and like if we need to go to a hospital. I am somewhat coherent at this point, but I was also reluctant to go to a hospital, even with the amount of pain that I was in. But that changed when I felt the need to like upchuck. So I like crawl over to the toilet lift the lid and I throw up and there's blood. This happens again later on, although in between I am just sprawled out entirely on the bathroom floor and partially into the shower. And my fiance is really starting to worry slash panic. Eventually though, she does say, like, we are going to uh this 24 hour emergency slash urgent care place that's relatively close by to us. So I get myself up off the floor and I'm constantly moaning in pain like several minutes after uh, the accident happened. I get into her car and we start driving toward the place and somehow I still have the presence of mind to pull out my phone and pull up the address of the place so that we know where we're going. But we get in there, and they start doing some tests on me, and they give me some painkillers so that I'm not constantly going, ah! And this is serious enough that my fiancé makes sure to let uh, all the members of my immediate family know what's going on. Which, uh, one of them is my older brother. By the way, I have an older brother. I can't remember if I mentioned that on this channel or not. But, um... He lives relatively close by, so he ends up coming to 
the emergency care place as well. And he's more or less there for um, moral support for me and to help my fiance uh, calm down. He's very level headed in situations like this. So he was undoubtedly helping at this point. They give me a couple of tests and um, they, well, I actually have it typed up here. This is for the chest x-ray that they did while I was there. Findings concerning for mid to distal esophageal perforation with extraluminal contrast and heterogeneous contents seen within posterior mediastinum with posterior mediastinal soft tissue infiltration, mild associated pneumomediastinum. It's at this point I should tell you biology was my worst subject in school, but I will try to explain what some of this means. The key term here is pneumomediastinum. The mediastinum is the tissue between organs. Uh, in this particular case, the tissue along the outside of the lungs. Pneumo means air, so that's air in tissue in between my lungs, which likely got there because um, of what they described before, esophageal perforation, which means a hole punched in the esophagus. So air got out through that and is now sitting on the outside of the lungs. I feel like chubby emu trying to break down some of these medical terms. So we have the diagnosis, and it's clear at this point I'm going to the hospital. But it's not entirely clear which hospital yet, because there are a couple of options. One of them is very close to where my older brother lives, and the other one is downtown, but is closer to where I live. And ultimately, uh, not knowing much about uh, how either hospital is or what they have available, I end up going to the one downtown. I didn't realize it at the time, but the hospital that was downtown had a special group that was dedicated to various forms of thoracic surgery, uh, which covers what I was going through. So we get to the hospital. It's very late at night, and um, they wheel me in. They have me like disrobe, get into a hospital gown, they get me a room, and they tell me that uh, the very next day I will be going through a procedure to uh, try and at least get the wound in my esophagus to a place where uh, it has a better chance to heal up and um, deal with any potential side effects resulting from it. Now the results I read before uh, suspected an esophageal perforation, and that term is why I use the words exploding esophagus. Uh, what really happened is the pressure built up, uh, and then uh, it caused the esophagus to lacerate. And part of that included a hole getting punched through it. And it was a decent sized hole. It wasn't like a pinprick or anything. It was... Uh, I think they described it in terms of, like inches long. I mean, it wasn't like a foot or anything, but it was like maybe that. If you can make that out. Which is a large wound for an esophagus. They load me up with painkillers and um, I learned the names of so many painkillers while I was in the hospital, uh, but I will get to that later. So the next day comes and um, they tell me, like, here's the time that the surgery's going to happen. And then the surgery actually happens a couple hours before that. Also, this was the first ever major surgery I've had. I'm, I'm not counting wisdom teeth removal. So I didn't know what to expect from it. So I'm asking, like, the doctors and the anesthesiologist questions about what surgery is like. And um, the anesthesiologist tells me, uh, you just kind of fall asleep and then wake up. Okay, that's a little vague, but thanks. But he was right. I remember being wheeled out of the prep area and toward where my procedure was happening, but I don't remember actually going into the room or them saying you're going to be put under anesthesia. I just remember being wheeled down a hall and then suddenly I'm back in the hospital bed in the room that I was assigned. And here's what they did. Oh my god, this is a long word. 
Uh, the short term is EGD, which stands for esophago-gastroduodenoscopy. What that basically means is they did an exploratory procedure where they stuck something in my mouth that went down my throat and explored the esophagus and the stomach after it. EGD today with possible endoluminal wound vac placement. A wound vac, as I understand it, and I kept calling it an HVAC while I was there, which is something completely different. A wound vac is something that covers up the wound and removes the air pressure from it. The vac basically means vacuum. So there's this research that says uh, removing the air pressure uh, can help certain kinds of wounds heal faster. And I'm all for that. I had been in that hospital for less than 24 hours, and I already wanted to get out as soon as I possibly could. So the initial thought was uh, they could cover up the uh, laceration slash perforation with the wound vac and then just allow it to heal. And they said that in like four or five days or so, they'd see where things stood and then have a better idea of when I could leave. Meanwhile, they also have uh, a tube down my throat because I can't eat or drink anything at this point. Um, a tube going down my throat and into my stomach to uh, like regulate the pressure in it. And that tube is not coming out my mouth, it is coming out my nose. Meanwhile, I get uh, another chest x-ray and this is what the result said. Pneumomediastinum. We already know what that is now. Small left pleural effusion. Now what that means is a little more concerning. That means there is a buildup of uh, some kind of fluid in the tissues lining the inside of the lungs. So possibly some kind of infection. Bilateral perihilar opacities along with airspace opacities in the left lung. So basically there's like a cloud of gas probably from the pneumomediastinum that is like blocking out part of uh, where they're trying to look with the x-rays. Now they saw the pleural effusion and um, the strategy they used to try and get rid of it was to make me pee a lot. While all that is going on, I'm being visited by uh, my fiance, my older brother, his wife, uh, my parent who lives several hours away, uh, drove into town and were visiting me and staying at my brother's place uh, to try and keep up with me for the next couple of days. Now as all this is going on, it is almost April 1st. And I had a video planned, which was basically a parody of the like PlayStation State of Play, Nintendo Direct. And uh, this had been in the planning for months. I usually come up with the ideas for my April Fool's video uh, several months in advance. In fact, I already know what I'm doing for the next one because I had the idea for it as I was making the uh, April Fool's video from this year. So that video had already been done, it was already scheduled, and I already had a bunch of tweets scheduled uh, that synced up with the timing of the video. So that was still able to go off without a hitch, although uh, I wasn't able to like participate in the chat as much as I wanted, because I was just on my phone. More importantly though, uh, even though I am able to do things like stand up from my hospital bed, which is a good sign that I still have uh, some of my strength and coordination, at least in my lower body, there were still some worrying signs. The left pleural effusion, or the fluid in my lungs, uh, it wasn't getting any better. In fact, it was getting worse. And there was some on the, the right side, in the right lung as well. In addition to that, the oxygen levels in my blood had dropped, and like, even without knowing that, I could tell that I was having to put more effort into breathing to not feel like, like I was lacking in oxygen. And, uh, yeah, things got moved up compared to what they were originally going to do. Uh, they were going to wait, um, I think it was originally supposed to be a week. 
but they moved up my procedure by like four days because now it was like a legitimate concern that uh but like me being alive was a legit concern at this point because the doctor didn't tell me this at the time all he said was uh this could be life-threatening that's the only thing he would say he wouldn't say anything about the odds of survival but he told me afterward that people who have the kind of injury that i did and then don't have it treated as quickly as possible, have about a one in four chance of dying. Which you might say, well, 75% is still pretty good odds of living. But I play Fire Emblem games, so 25% uh, going against me is still really worrying. Anything that's not zero is worrying in my book. I could tell this was more serious because, uh, I was being visited by my fiance and my family members again, and they looked worried. And my usual approach to pressure situations is to try and diffuse it with humor. So instead of talking about the procedure, I'm talking about like football, video games, just whatever, cracking jokes here and there. If I had known the gravity of the situation at the time, I would have said something different uh, before I got wheeled to the operating room because uh when your last words to someone potentially are saying don't cry over me like a bunch of little bitches yeah i would i would want to say something else now the first procedure i was out by the time i got to the operating room this time was different uh this time by the way when they do operations uh they take away my glasses so i can't really make out anything i'm just going down these blurry hallways uh occasionally hearing a doctor who's not working on me talk about another patient and then i get into this large room and i can see the table uh, off to the side that i'm going to be operated on and um i can see a bunch of people clearly ready for a surgery moving around and I hear music, and one of the doctors says, uh, any music you want us to put on that you can listen to as the anesthesia kicks in. And I'm thinking, all right, I'm going to go to something that usually psychs me up. They mentioned this is life-threatening, so I want to, like, fall asleep with energy. I, I don't even know what I'm talking about with that. But I'm like, yes, I know what song I'm going to play. It's one of my favorite songs. It's by Joe Satriani. It's Lights of Heaven. No, wait. I probably shouldn't request something with the word heaven in it in a life-threatening situation. So I go, all right. Uh, another song on the same album that I really like is called Train of Angels. No, wait, fuck, no. No heaven, no angels. I do not need to be thinking about that as I go under. So I go, okay, uh, another song I like, same album. Up in the sky. No, wait, fuck, that's where heaven is. No heaven, no angels, no sky. So, fuck it, I asked them to put on Crystal Planet. And that is what I'm listening to as the anesthesia kicks in and I go under. They said that this was going to be a long procedure. The original one was like 45 minutes to an hour. This one is three to four hours. And the entire time, uh, my fiance and my family are in the waiting area. <clears throat> Just uh, hoping for the best. I eventually come out of surgery and uh, feel a bit different. Um, I can definitely tell that uh, I have a massive scar, even though I can't see it. The scar went from, um, well, I still have it. It didn't just go away. And I, I can actually feel it under my shirt. It starts here, like right above the belly button. And it goes up. And around, and then it ends here, like a couple inches below the armpit. And that was not all. Um, actually, I should read the surgery notes for this. So something I should have mentioned before is not only was there fluid in my lungs, uh, there was atelectasis, which means the uh, collapse of part or all of the lung. So here's the list of things that they did. Esophagus. Go gastroduodenoscopy. Okay, the EGD thing from earlier. 
a bronchoscopy, esophageal perforation repair, thoracoabdominal, insertion of chest tube, insertion jejunostomy tube, that is a feeding tube. So the chest tube was actually not just one chest tube, but two. Uh, one that went in here and one that went in here. And uh, those tubes would go in and drain fluid and potentially pockets of air from in slash around my lungs. The esophageal perforation repair, uh, thor thoracoabdominal, uh, that basically meant the wound vac wasn't working, so they had to get a little more hands-on to like, actually repair the thing. In fact, for part of the procedure, they actually took some fatty tissue from my stomach area and used it as sort of an adhesive to hold things together. To this point, uh, all the food I'd been getting th uh, was uh, through an IV into my arm, and there was another tube, another drainage tube, that was like right above where the feeding tube was inserted. And on top of all that, there's still the nasogastric tube for decompression of the stomach, since like the intestines weren't going to be contracting as much, and that could affect like the pressure level in the stomach. Just butting in real quick to mention a tube they inserted in me that I forgot about, and this is going to be a little gross. They put a catheter in, and uh, that was actually also the first tube that came out, and when they took that out, I still wasn't able to move around much because of the machines I was hooked up to. So their solution for any time I had to pee was to give me a jug. And then I would have to call a nurse to come and empty it whenever it was used. They were also very aware of infections because going into the surgery, I'd been uh, running high fevers. Although there were a couple of times when I was there that they said I had a f high fever and the thermometer was wrong. Because sometimes they took my temperature like after I was doing rehab, which we'll get to that later. But yeah, not a good time to try and assess body temperature right after physical activity. So after this procedure, I was just all kinds of messed up. Because uh, aside from all the tubes in me and uh, all the, like, the fever that I was running, there was still a massive amount of pain coming from where the injury was. And on top of that, I now had some pain around where like, the tubes were, where the surgery scar was. And uh, I got very acquainted with multiple painkillers. The first one was acetaminophen which is basically Tylenol in liquid form. Uh, the second one, uh, which was stronger, was uh, called Dilaudid. Or at least that's what they called it. I don't know the proper name for it. But uh, it's something that would go in through an IV, and then like seconds later, you just feel very warm and relaxed. It's not the kind of thing that's for long-term pain relief, but it does give you like very immediate relief. And then there was the oxycodone. The oxycodone was uh, a more long-term pain relief solution, and it was more effective than the Tylenol. But uh, it had an added side effect, which was uh, something you had to take another thing for called Senna. Senna is a stool softener. Although that doesn't accurately describe it, it's more of a stool liquefier. I was also being made to take uh, metoprolol, which is something that you take for when your heart rate is too high. I already have um, sort of, well, a relatively high uh, natural resting heart rate, but it was like getting even higher than that because all the stress that I was going through. So they decided to give me something for that to help keep my heart rate lower. And on top of all of that, I was now dealing with the side effects of uh, getting fed through an IV. Because one of the side effects is it causes your feet to swell up. So I was basically being given every reason uh, between all the tubes sticking out of me, the pain that I was in, my feet swelling up, uh, the fevers I was having, to just not do anything but lay in bed. But I am a restless person by nature. So, um, I would still, like, in a relatively short time from uh, when I had the second surgery, the major one, 
um, I asked the night nurse one day if I could stand up from the bed. And this was a several minute long ordeal because I'm laying in bed, I have all these like tubes sticking out of me that have machines. So they have to move the machines around so that I don't like pull on a tube or a cable. I have all these like IVs going into my arms. But when I came out of the hospital, I looked like I'd been doing heroin for a decade. Just so many punctures and bruising all up and down my arms and even on my hands. And um, by the way, trying to like run anything through like around where the hand is really fucking hurts. Like it's okay for a little bit, but after a while of stuff starting to throw, flow through it, it gets painful, it swells up, it's not a good time. But anyway, the night nurse does like maneuver all this machinery around so that like I'm not even like walking around much at this point. I just stand from the bed and I was practically crying cuz like up until that point I know that there are things you can be in the hospital for longer for, and that, um, like, you're basically completely bedridden for. But even in the short time, relatively short time that I was there, like, you wonder if you'll be able to do certain things again. And this was, well, there were no steps involved, but it was the first step toward getting back to something resembling normal. And by the way, uh, the, the night nurse who was helping me with this was a guy named Dave, who um, he was assigned to me for uh, several days in a row, and we ended up bonding a little bit. He was very open to conversation, regardless of what the subject was. Um, and since he was the night nurse, um, I would have Adult Swim on the TV, assuming they weren't showing Rick and Morty, because fuck that. And he's just perplexed by what's showing up on the TV. Like, I had the experience of uh, explaining to him what Mike Tyson Mysteries is as two other doctors are in the room uh, puncturing my veins in either arm with needles trying to get blood out because sometimes blood just won't come out. And they have to, like, redo the puncture somewhere else. So that that was a weird time. As all this is going on, I'm still getting visited by my fiance, my immediate family, and then friends of mine who live in the area are also coming to visit. My bandmates come to visit. And um, the, I also get a few things from certain people. I got these get well cards from various family members. I got, uh, well, my mother knows I'm into video games. So, she actually got me a copy of um, Kirby and the Forgotten Land, but she didn't understand the difference between buying a digital download code and buying a physical copy. So, I'll have to get that physical at some point. She knows that I had an interest of some sort at some point in Pokemon, so she got this. I mean, Pikachu's not really one of my favorite Pokemon, but uh, I appreciated the thought, at least. Plus, this is kind of like, can you see the texture on this thing? And then there was my fiancé, who knows uh, in more detail what I like in Pokemon. <laughs> so, she managed to get me one of my favorites. And yes, um, going through a life-threatening surgery and then having a ghost Pokemon given to you. <laughs> um, eh. The thing that really got me, though, was um, I have um, a cousin who like lives several states away. Back when we were much younger, we would our families would meet up like once a year at least, and they would stay over for a few days. So it didn't feel so much like uh, distant cousins, and um, they actually felt more like siblings. So anyway, um, she gets word of what's going on, and. Uh, she, her husband, and uh, a mutual friend send me this huge thing of balloons. Not only do these take up a significant amount of space in the uh, 
the hospital room, but they turned out to be extremely resilient, as I will detail later. Now, the number one thing that uh, they asked me to do was rest, but it's a hospital environment, so that is very hard to do. For one thing, um, there's always like nurses or doctors like immediately outside your door, either walking past or stopping and talking with nurses or um, talking to the nutrition people about who needs what to eat, who can't have what, etc. And that's at almost all hours of the day. Uh, the other issue is, uh, even during the night time, they regularly check the levels of everything in your blood. They regularly do temperature checks. Uh, one thing I had to do because of the thing with my lungs was uh, I had to do various breathing exercises with another nurse. And then on top of that, uh, every night around four-ish in the morning, uh, I would have a chest x-ray done. Now, I could stay in bed for the x-ray, but there was like a slot in the back of the bed that they had to slide the screen in through, and I would have to like lean up a bit so they could get it in and out. Uh, so yeah, try sleeping through that. If I had a bout of pain in the middle of the night, I would have to call the nurse. And uh, sometimes it was a crapshoot for how long it would take the nurse to respond. Because the nurses in this hospital uh, were all taking care of anywhere between one and four patients at the same time. So sometimes you would just have to wait your turn. I had one instance where I hit the call button and the nurse didn't show up for an hour and a half. Hey, this is editing in post SCXCR with uh, a couple of things that I didn't mention when I was recording this video that I wanted to bring up and I simply forgot to. The first thing is that uh, every nurse that came to my room thought that I was in a car accident when they initially read my profile because the severity and location of the injury is usually associated with some sort of traumatic accident that involves either a very hard impact or like, even getting impaled with something. And the second thing is, Every nurse that came into the room throughout my entire stay would always ask me my name and date of birth before doing anything. And it was annoying, but I understand why they do that. The first thing, and this is not the main thing, but it's a minor thing that can come up, is uh, it's a minor cognizance test. Does the patient know who they are and what's going on? But the primary reason that they do this is they are making absolutely sure that they are dealing with the right patient and giving them the right treatment. Because as I said, nurses can go through several different patients in a single day and they have to keep track of everything. And then on top of all of that, um, this hospital did take care of uh, women who were giving birth to children. so. Every time a baby was born in the hospital, you would hear this lullaby jingle over the loudspeaker. Why did we need to know that a child was born? Fuck if I know. And it was not just that they would play this jingle. The jingle was extremely low quality. Like, it sounded like something out of a YouTube poop. There were a couple of times that I would use my phone to get on Discord and chat with um, <clears throat> some friends just to let them know how I'm doing, that I'm going to be okay, etc., etc. And I think at one point I mentioned, you know, if they're going to play something for every time a baby's born, it's only fair that they play another jingle for every time someone dies. Speaking of friends, uh, I should mention how uh, one of my friends in particular reacted. So, I've been a friend for a while with uh, Zero Master. He makes YouTube videos, he streams on Twitch. And um, he, like, as soon as he heard what was going on with me, he was like, uh, do you want to go fund me put up for your medical costs? Because, like, I can do that. And I told him, no, 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 no. It's fine. It's fine. I have insurance, so we'll see how much that covers and then go from there. Uh, it turns out my insurance covered a lot. Like I said, um, if you don't count wisdom teeth, this was my first surgery slash series of surgeries for anything. 
and it was something that was just kind of a freak accident. It wasn't like I smoked a lot and got cancer or anything. Uh, in all, the medical bills that I had to pay totaled about a little over $10,000 for the entire, like, everything. All the surgeries, all the medications, all the home nursing, which we'll get to later. Yeah, if I had to pay the full cost, which was about $300,000, that would have bankrupted me, that would have bankrupted my fiance, that would have bankrupted multiple immediate family members. That or I'd have to, like, sell off this house, which we just got not too long ago. Anyway, back to recovering in the hospital. Uh, I am still, uh, like, loopy as hell from the amount of painkillers that I'm on. Anything that involves, like, a rapid contraction of the diaphragm or muscles in my chest, uh, hurts quite a bit. So there would be some days where I would sneeze a couple of times and just be in hideous pain. Or one time I had a violent coughing fit and immediately requested painkillers afterward. The entire time this is going on, I still can't eat or drink anything. The most they'll allow me to do is take a damp sponge and like move it around inside my mouth so that my mouth doesn't dry out. But they still tell me, like, you can like rub it against your gums and the inside of your mouth, but you can't swallow any of it. About three or four days after the surgery, they say, uh, we can take one of the tubes out of you. Um, it's the one that's like right above where the feeding tube would go in. And it doesn't drain into a machine, it just drains into this little bag of sorts that they would empty now and then. So I'm thinking, okay, uh, give me a painkiller and take the tube out. And they go, no, 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 no painkiller necessary. And I go, so they just undo the stitch that was holding the tube in place. And then they tell me, take a deep breath, and they pull it straight out. Describing the feeling of it, um, I mean, it did hurt a little, but it was more just odd. It was something that I would come to call the weird hurt. Where, yes, there's a little pain, but it's largely masked by just how weird it feels. Now, at this point, um, I'm getting into more physical therapy. Like, my fever's starting to die down. My feet are still a little swollen, but that wasn't going to stop me. Uh, I'm able to, uh, with the assistance of the nurses, obviously, uh, stand up from bed. I can walk around the room a little bit. And uh, eventually, uh, they say, we're going to do some marching exercises, uh, if you're able to. Now, keep in mind, um, to this point, like when they tell me to just stand next to the bed and see if you can bend your knees, I would stand on one foot and then bend down on my knee, not to show off, but just to see what all I was still capable of. And uh, it turned out to be a decent amount when it came to my legs. So there comes a point where um, they unhook me from a bunch of machines, uh, plug up my IVs, and uh, they take the two boxes that the chest tubes are draining into and they like hook them onto this walker for me and they go we're gonna walk down the hallway uh just let us know when you get tired and feel like going back i go the entire length of the hallway with, with the nurse walking right beside me and then we go all the way back and then we go down the hallway again and come back uh i don't think he was expecting me to do that much which actually uh, led to another thing I realized. I looked forward to when the physical therapy nurses would show up because it was my chance to get up, move around, and see something other than the one wall of my hospital room. Uh, apparently, I'm in the minority for that. The physical therapy nurses said they actually looked forward to me because I wanted to do the physical therapy, whereas like, almost everybody else that they dealt with just wanted to keep lying in bed. I mean, I guess it depends what you're recovering from. Uh, I was still in a position where my legs were perfectly fine, so I didn't mind getting up walking around a little bit. 
there was another thing that they would have me do for physical therapy, which was um, they would bring this step into my room and then tell me, go up the step with both feet and then down the step with both feet at your own pace. And eventually I'm going at like a jazzercise pace, just up and down the step with the left foot first, with the right foot first. Meanwhile, I'm still watching Adult Swim. Dave's not appearing as often now because he's not assigned to me. And uh, it was the first time I had ever seen Bob's Burgers. And I am never going to watch Bob's Burgers again. Time passes. I'm still recovering. They're being more proactive at dealing with my pain. Because apparently, uh, they would ask me regularly, what's your pain level on a scale of 1 to 10? And then I would usually say like, three i think the highest i ever said was seven and uh, apparently in comparison with all the other patients in the hospital i would habitually rank my pain lower so they just said like i mean he says he's a five but i mean compare with everybody else i mean mm -hmm. but uh that meant that they were going to be more proactive particularly with the like tylenol-ish painkiller and meanwhile uh, I start doing these tests called esophagrams. Basically, uh, it's an x-ray of your whole chest, uh, focusing on the esophagus, and they have you drink this, like, contrast fluid, or I can't remember if it was barium or what, but, uh, point is, they have you go like this, and make sure you have the drink off to the side, and you turn, you sip, a little bit of it through a straw. I had like three or four different variants of this contrast and all of them tasted awful. But uh, eventually after one of these esophagrams, they give me the news that I can eat something. That something is little chips of ice. Now oddly they didn't say, oh you can drink water now, because presumably they're worried about me like gulping down too much of it and putting too much strain on uh, what's left to heal in the esophagus. Because they didn't say that um, the perforation had healed, or that uh, most of the laceration had healed. Uh, they just said, you can have these little chips of ice now. And not long after that, they said, hey, guess what? You're getting another tube pulled out of you. Uh, specifically, it was the chest tube on my right side. Apparently that one wasn't draining anything anymore, so they said, all right, we're taking that one out. And uh, again, no uh, anesthesia or painkillers whatsoever. They just got rid of the stitch holding it in place, said take a deep breath, yanked it out. The weird hurt happened, and uh, they covered that up with a bandage, and it eventually healed. It was not long after that when uh, they said that I could try uh, apple juice and possibly jello. And that lasted for maybe a day or two before they did another test and said, you know what, we should take him off of those until he heals a bit more, which, thanks for teasing me like that. And I mentioned that uh, my family was visiting me a lot. Uh, at some point they did have to go home because they still have work and shit to do. Uh, my fiancé, however, was there every night. Uh, every night, because uh, she couldn't keep getting off work. And um, there was a cutoff for visitation hours, but they were very lax and would let her stay for like a couple hours, three hours past when the cutoff was. I'm marrying the right person, is what I think I'm saying. But uh, eventually they started asking me questions about what my home situation is like. Is your home like multi-level? Uh, the floor that you sleep slash rest on is like everything you would need on that floor? Or do you have to go up and down stairs? Uh, do you have a bathtub or a shower? Uh, is it a walk-in? Uh, do you have enough people around at home who would be supporting you? And the entire point of this was they were trying to figure out uh, when slash if I could go home. And it turned out uh, I could go home on um, the 14th of April, which was about 10 days after the major surgery. Obviously, it felt great to be home. However, um, there were a lot of things that I had to start uh, 
doing, not necessarily on my own, but with the help of the people around me. And uh, that involved ordering a ton of medical supplies. So I get home, and there's like boxes and boxes and boxes of um, like a feed solution, because I still had the feeding tube in, and that's where I was getting most of my nutrition from. By which I mean all of my nutrition. And um, there was also uh, the setup for the feed, which you couldn't just have the feed solution and like put it straight into the tube. No, you had to uh, set up this machine called, I think it was a kangaroo joey. It's something that like cycles the feed in a bag through this series of tubes that attaches to the feeding tube. And you would have it on this stand. Um, with the feed bag and then a water bag. Because uh, if the feed spent like too long just being stationary in the tube, it would start to dry up and harden. So you would have the flush come through to uh, try and keep everything clear. I'm butting in again to mention a couple other things. First of all is the maintenance involved with the whole feed setup. You had to take two boxes of a feeding solution, mix them up, and then dump them into a bag, which you would have to change every day. You would also have to flush the feeding tube from the valve every day to make sure that the line stayed clear to the intestine. You would also have to change the water flush bag every day. And you would have to flush the line leading to the feeding tube every day. And one other note about when I got home. Uh, one of the things that I didn't have a chance to do while I was in the hospital was shave. So this is about as much of a beard as you will ever see me have. This was taken shortly after I got home and before I shaved all of it off. I couldn't lay completely flat on my bed uh, because there was a risk of like, if you had the feeding tube running, or if you had the feeding tube running too soon before you tried falling asleep, it could run back up, go up through your throat, and cause you to asphyxiate in your sleep. So I had to sleep at like a 30 degree angle. Uh, initially, we did that by just piling up a bunch of pillows. But the problem is, I'm one of those people that tends to like toss around in my sleep. And I had to learn how to just lay completely flat for an entire night. But because we were dealing with just a pile of pillows, it wasn't that even. So my head would end up like way off to the side and I would wake up with just a massively stiff neck. Although that was assuming the pain didn't wake me up first because I uh, also had to get my own painkillers. Which um, in the state that I was in when I got back from the hospital, I couldn't do a whole lot by myself. Because, um, aside from just lacking physical strength, particularly in the upper body, which I still kind of am, I had to uh, move around this, like, wheeled stand thing with all my feed stuff on it, and carry around the chest box for the chest tube that was still sticking out of my left side. And at this point, I could still only have ice chips, which, I mean, we can do ice cubes here, but, I mean, that's pretty much it. Uh, although eventually we were able to get uh, apple juice and jello uh, back on the diet. That happened after uh, one of the doctor's visits. I had several doctor's visits after going home. Some of them were esophagrams, some of them were general checkups. Um, one of them eventually got the other tube out, but that wasn't for another few days. And I was just trying to find ways to keep my mind occupied at home. Uh, I would play Scrabble with uh, one of my parents. Um, my brother hooked me up with something called Pluto TV, which I usually don't watch any TV, but I found a couple of things that I enjoyed on that. Um, I'd also uh, try to play bass, Although it's hard to play bass guitar when you've got like a tube sticking out here, a tube sticking out here. I started taking uh, very short work assignments I could do from home. And um, 
I did stream at one point uh, after coming back from the hospital, and the people who um, like showed up for that and the amount of support that I got uh, from them and from people I should mention uh, who like sent photos of them wearing like clothes that had my logo on them, like I still don't know how to react to that properly except to say thank you. Eventually, um, cabin fever was starting to hit really hard. Um, the doctors said that it was okay to disconnect from the feeding machine for like a decent amount of time, just as long as I was able to get my nutrients in the rest of the day. So um, I would start disconnecting from the feed machine. I would still have to carry the chest box for the chest tube while I still had that. And uh, just walk around the neighborhood with my fiance just to A, get out of the house, and B, get some exercise. I was taking all my medications regularly, but I would also get visits from a home nurse. Uh, what they do is basically come by, uh, check all your vitals. Uh, if you had bandages that needed to be changed, uh, they would take care of that. Because the bandages like around here would have to be changed every other day. And uh, we didn't know how to do that at first, so the home nurse did it. And then eventually uh, one of my family members did it. And then eventually I did it. Uh, I eventually learned how to do like bandage changes, uh, setting up my feed, uh, taking my medications, and otherwise taking care of myself as I was able to like become more alert and aware mentally and start to get my coordination and strength back. However, there was the time, well, a couple of times, when the feeding tube got clogged. So the solution to that is usually to try and like aspirate uh, the tube. So you like apply pressure, pull it back, apply pressure, pull it back with um, like a plastic syringe thing that you attach to the tube. That wasn't working. Plan C was cherry Coke. They actually said uh, like you could use soda to try and break down the clog and help it pass through. And uh, this was okay, because instead of having a tube going into my stomach, which would be like too close to where the esophagus was still healing, I had a J-tube, which meant it, it went through here and then into my intestine. That was apparently okay. And uh, cherry co the, bleh, the cherry Coke did unclog the tube. That's why I tweeted at one point, cherry Coke is king. Finally, toward around the end of April, they did eventually pull the other tube out of my chest. And I was incredibly grateful for that, but I barely had time to feel grateful for it because I started doing something that I hadn't done um, throughout the whole course of this, which was throwing up. It would happen once every few hours, and we weren't sure why this was happening. That said, uh, I did have a medical procedure that was coming up later where um, they were going to go through, uh, do, a, do another scope, see about putting like a stint into the esophagus to help cover it up and help it heal. And in the process of that, they wound up like scoping my stomach again and they found a bunch of crap in there, which was... I can't remember if it was the infection or was like a carryover from an infection, but uh, it was making me sick. So they cleared that out. And when I woke up from that procedure, they told me that I would have to stay in the hospital again. And that is like top three for most pissed off I have ever been at anything. The good news is, uh, not only did that hospital stay only last for a couple of days, but uh, in the process of it, I got to meet Night Nurse Dave again. So now I'm out of the hospital. Uh, the only tube that I still have in me at this point is the feeding tube. And uh, so just got to take care of that, follow the feeding schedule, and hopefully that'll be out relatively soon. In the process, though, they allowed me to eat a couple other things. Uh, particularly pasta and those bricks of ramen, uh, as long as they're overcooked, because I still wasn't in a state where I could handle properly cooked 
pasta. It had to be like a little mushy, which at this point I wasn't going to be picky because it was actual food. The good news, however, is uh, by this point I was like alert enough that I could play most video games. When I was in the hospital, I could pretty much only play uh, Easy Come Easy Golf and maybe a level of Kirby. Uh, but by this point, I was like playing Gran Turismo 3 with my fiance. I was able to hop on Killing Floor for a bit. But then um, when I was changing the bandage for the feeding tube, I started to notice that uh, the feeding tube was like held in with a single stitch and the stitch was, and the skin it was attached to were starting to stretch. I like told the doctors about this and they said, okay, um, it's not an emergency, but we are going to schedule you to come in as quickly as you possibly can. But it's not an emergency, but get your ass over here, but it's not an emergency. And this is where um, they said that, okay, we have to replace the stitch for it. Do you want any sort of painkiller for it? Because we're going to warn you, you might not want the painkiller for it. And I said, what, what, what the hell are you talking about? Uh, yes, I want a painkiller for it. And I think that's when one of the fingers curled back on the monkey's paw. Like, I wish for painkiller for this procedure. You're going to get it. But the painkiller itself is going to hurt. Because instead of just, like, jabbing me in the stomach once and then putting the painkiller in, they put it in, pull it out, put it back in. They inject the painkiller in four different sites to get this one stitch in. And on top of that, the painkiller burns as they inject it into you. And it has a side effect of headaches. So maybe I would have just been better off just saying, screw the painkiller, just give me the stitch. So that got fixed. And then uh, as all this is going on, uh, I have to cancel for multiple events. Uh, I was going to be involved with something for Midwest Speed Fest. That couldn't happen. Uh, there was another speedrun marathon I was going to do. I had to cancel that one. And then uh, there was Combo Breaker, where I was going to be commentating for uh, the top four of Bloody Roar Extreme. I had to cancel that as well. But the good news is that um, throughout all of this, this is toward the, like, the end of May, early June now, um, I'm able to eat a couple more things. I can have mac and cheese. I can have milkshakes. I actually learned how to make those myself now. I'm taking less and less painkillers, which is good because there was a shortage of painkillers in all the pharmacies in my area. Unfortunately, that happened when I still kind of needed them. And then by the time I got the painkillers, like I was starting to get to the point where I wasn't needing them as often. And I eventually got to the point where I was going a day without painkillers, two days without painkillers. And I'm like, okay. Uh, Things have gotten significantly better. I've got to be at the point soon where they can just rip this tube out of me. In the meantime, I'm also going on much longer walks with my fiance, ones that last like over a mile. I'm able to drive a car, although getting in is awkward because like with a tube here, it's like kind of hurts to compress that part of your body as you get into the car. Instead of wheeling around the thing with the feed machine on it. I am just carrying it between rooms and up and down stairs. The visiting nurse is coming less often, and when they did show up, they'd be like, okay, here's your vitals, that's your blood pressure, that's your temperature. Need anything else? No, you're taking care of all of it yourself? All right, well, uh, I guess I'll leave. Now, as this is going on, I still have those balloons that were given to me by uh, my cousin and other people, and those are finally starting to deflate. And it was around like early June when one of the balloons finally touched the ground. And it was around that time that I started getting this like weird feeling in my stomach. It wasn't a painful one, it was just like a feeling that I didn't have before. So I go in for a checkup. Um, I'm really just hoping that they say my esophagus is healed. The first news they give me after doing a scan of my chest is that uh, the stent that they put in my esophagus to help cover up where the esophagus was healing, uh, it got loose and dropped into my stomach. So what does that mean? Well, it means they're going to have to do a separate procedure to go in and retrieve that and take it out. 
but without the stint in place, they could get a clear view of what the esophagus looked like. And it was healed. And I didn't know how to take that news. I liken it to, um, what's his name? Todd Wayneo in World War Z, the book. I never saw the movie. Uh, when he hears that um, the war against the zombie horde is over, and he goes, peace. What does that mean? Because all he knew for so long was fighting. So after getting that news, they uh, scheduled me for another procedure, which was um, like so many days afterward. I think it was like a week afterward or so. And um, they had me do one last esophagram test before then, just to be like absolutely 100% sure, even though the doctor was already like 100% sure. But this was just to verify everything. So in that esophagram test, it was uh, a bit different from the one before. I think they were just trying to be thorough because usually it's like I said, you stand like this, drink something like this. They may tell you to like do it with the opposite hand or drink a little bit, have several sips in a row, whatever. But for this one, it almost turned into a theme park ride because I'm standing on this thing. There's a board behind me. They have me drink on it, like in front of it, I mean. And then they say, all right, we're going to tilt it back. So the board, like I'm standing here and the board is like this and the board just tilts back like that and I end up laying flat on my back. They tell me, okay, uh, drink some more. So I'm laying down and I'm drinking like this. And then they go, oh, okay, uh, get on your stomach if you could. So like, I mean, I still have the feeding tube here, but I get on the stomach as best I can. And I'm like this and I'm drinking like this. And then they go, all right, we're going to get you up. And then they push me back up while I'm still laying on my stomach. But in the end, um, all the tests came back uh, showing no tears, no holes in the esophagus. So I am good for the surgery. Like, actually, there was an appointment beforehand where they gave me this stuff. When I first got out of the hospital, all I could really do was uh, sponge baths. There were just too many bandages, too many tubes still in. And um, you can't risk, like, taking a shower and having, like, soap get into a wound or anything. Once I had, like, the chest tubes out and it was just the feeding tube, um, I could take a saran wrap shower. Which, what that means is um, you still have the feeding tube, so you can't have anything touching that. So the solution to that, to be able to take a shower of some sort is to uh, take a bunch of saran wrap and wrap it around your torso where the feeding tube is and then tape off the top of it so that water doesn't get underneath it. And then when you're done with your shower, you like sponge bath the rest of the stuff that you couldn't get under the saran wrap. Now, however, they were telling me to uh, use this particular soap uh, slash skin cleanser um, the night before the procedure and the morning of the procedure. And the procedure was very early in the morning, so I'm up before the sun bathing in this. And uh, just let me read some of the warnings on this. Do not use if allergic to ingredients in the soap, obviously. Do not use in the genital area. Keep out of eyes, ears, and mouth. May cause serious and permanent eye injury if permitted to enter and remain in the eye, or may cause deafness when instilled in the middle ear through perforated eardrums. Repeated general cleansing of large body areas should not be done except when advised by a healthcare provider. So it's a soap that uh, you could very easily do some damage to yourself with. So I'm like trying to take a shower with this and bathe with this like they instructed me to. They never had me do this for the other procedures, so I didn't really understand why they had me do it for this one. But if it got the feeding tube and the stint out of me, I didn't give a shit. So I'm like very carefully putting this on like a washcloth from this far away 
but my glasses are off so I'm like trying to get close but not too close as I apply this and like work it up in the washcloth and then like very carefully wash myself with this stuff. I had been off the feeding tube, I hadn't eaten anything for a while, which the food that I was eating up to this point, like what I could, they made very clear that uh, they weren't having me eat that for nutritional value. It was more so to keep my own sanity. Like when you go so long without feeling hunger at all, uh, it kind of plays with you mentally uh, if you don't like start having food regularly. And then you suddenly get off of this and you have to go back to like feeling hunger and then eating regularly again. But I go through the surgery, it goes off without a hitch, they, the feeding tube is out, and they tell me, look, uh, we said you're healed, but we still want you to work back up gradually to a proper diet. So first day uh, was basically liquids only. Second day was soft foods. So like overcooked pasta and ramen, stuff like that. Which by the way, pizza sauce on pasta actually works pretty well if you can't have regular pasta sauce. And then the next day I could start um, having like regular foods. And uh, even then I kind of planned to work myself back into it. Uh, like the first proper meal that I had was uh, ramen. Not the brick of ramen, like legit ramen from a ramen place. Because I figured that's a lot of broth, the meat is sliced thin, there's noodles. That'll be a good like, way to work back into food. And I'm butting in one last time to add a couple of things that I missed during the initial recording of this. The first note is just how quick my recovery was. I was injured on the 30th of March and went into the hospital that night. And my last surgery was on June 13th. That means my total recovery period for this, well, the part involving doctors and procedures at least, was just under two and a half months, which the doctors said was surprisingly fast. And apparently even when I got home, they were still expecting this process to take significantly longer, because when I came home, there were boxes and boxes of supplies and by the time all of this was over and I didn't need to use the feeding tube stuff anymore, we still had several boxes filled with bags and tubes and syringes and feeding solution. And after doing the math, uh, those supplies would have helped me uh, stay on the feed for about another month and a half. So maybe this entire time there has been just a little bit of zoanthrope blood in me. And I have a massive list of like 40 or so restaurants that I've been gradually going through since I uh, got like back to where I can have food again. And uh, there was one other thing I guess I should end with from uh, all of this, which is um, I'm like several days removed from the last surgery, but I'm still not 100% yet. Uh, they made clear uh, when I was going out of the hospital that um, you have to not just recover from what you were in the hospital for, you also kind of have to recover from the hospital itself. Uh, they said that like it takes four days of living back at home to readjust from one day of being in the hospital. So on top of that, um, I'm still not quite back at 100%. I am at the point where I can uh, rollerblade now, but uh, there's still some physical deficiencies that I have to work through. Uh, my upper body strength still isn't back yet. What little definition I had in like my torso and my stomach, completely gone. Uh, I actually lost weight as much as 20 pounds uh, when I was at my lightest while going through all of this, but um, my amount of muscle mass went down and body fat went up. The surgical scar, which um, was held together with glue that just kind of dried and fell off over time, 
It's still a little sore in some areas. I mentioned it goes like almost up to the armpit here. So that affected like my range of motion with my left arm. Like I can do this perfectly fine with my right arm, but with my left arm, I get to here and it starts to tighten up. So I just need to do some stretches and like wait for some of the soreness to go away from that. I can still feel discomfort from where the chest tubes were like pushing stuff out of the way in me to get to my lungs. So um, my body still needs to readjust to that. But I am close to 100%. I guess I can end with this. I actually made a request of the doctors that was a joke. And they took it seriously. My request was that uh, I, they give me the feeding tube after they remove it. So that I could drop kick it in celebration. Well, uh, funny thing about that. Here's the feeding tube. I don't know how well this is going to show up, but um, this part here is the part that was inserted into my intestine. And you have to go all the way back. This is where the stitching is, where I entered my stomach. And then it goes all the way up there. All of that was inside my body. And then this was the valve that was dangling loose that the feed machine had to hook up to. Well, I said that I was going to dropkick it as a joke, but...